I feel like I'm in an abandoned ghost town because no matter where you look, see for yourselves, everything's abandoned. Back in the days of the Soviet Union, this used to be one of the areas of extreme tension on the political map. Why? Because only 50 miles separate this coast and the American soil. That's the reason the Soviets invested crazy loads of money and stuff into this place and moved here lots of manpower. They built here all the infrastructure and moved here entire garrisons, or rather, entire military bases. My dear people, today I'm going to get inside the Soviet easternmost top secret nuclear military base. It was a secret to everyone, and in complete secrecy, tens of thousands of troops and loads of heavy machinery and equipment have been moved here to build and man silos for ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. Unofficially, this project was dubbed the Invasion Army. This is Lyadov, reporting today from a former top-secret restricted access military settlement located very close to the border separating Russia and the United States. I remember that feeling when I wandered through these corridors under the secret base. It is really amazing. It feels like you are in the middle of computer games. Seriously, it's very exciting. Could you guys imagine yourself when you're stood at the helm of the USSR or USF of the Second World War and like the whole world was in your hands? It's really unbelievable. And now you can feel something like that even without leaving your home, just with your phone, with a Conflict of Nations, which is a free online PvP strategy game. Just imagine, in this game you can choose a real country, lead this country and fight during the World War III. There are up to 128 players in games in real time, simultaneously. You can play for weeks to complete. The trick is that you can create your army yourself, choose tanks, jets and even submarines with nuclear weapons on board. And the coolest thing that I like most about this game is that you're a president of your country, which means that you can do whatever you want. So for example, you can declare war to other countries or forge alliances with other players. And you can choose your own strategy, engage in public battles and take over the world. This is really cool, guys. This is also very convenient that you can play the same account with your mobile or your PC, for example. And today you can get an exclusive gift. Click on the link in the description to get 13,000 of gold and one month of premium subscription for free. This offer is available only for 30 days, so don't lose time. So, click the link in the description, choose your country and fight the way you want to victory. Okay, people, just off the top of your heads, without Googling it, give me your estimate of how far the United States are from Russia. What we usually think of is first traveling to Moscow and then taking a 10 to 11 hour long transatlantic flight to New York, right? And in absence of one, it takes even longer and feels like trying to get to another planet. So what would you say if I told you that not only do these two big countries share a border and are pretty close to each other, but in fact, only a laughable distance of 2.4 miles actually separates Russia and the USA, just 2.4 miles. These are the two Diomede Islands in the middle of the Bering Strait. Little Diomede is part of the United States, and Big Diomede is part of Russia. Big Diomede is located about 22 miles to the east of Cape Desnev, the easternmost main point of the Asian continent. You could say about half an hour drive away, but this is how it looks in reality. That tiny tower is located on Cape Desnev, and Big Diomede is right on the horizon, and America is just behind it. The view is epic. This is where two huge continents meet, Eurasia and North America, and two major oceans, the Arctic and the Pacific. The Bering Strait is covered by ice that nonetheless never freezes completely, so you can't simply walk or ski over it. Not that no one has ever tried. People have always been trying, so any new arrivals to the area are under special scrutiny and surveillance. We're finally about to take off, and we're onto a place in real hardcore tundra on the Cape Desnev coast, where 
I am only shooting myself. Doesn't matter, turn off the camera. Well, you get the idea. This plane flies to our destination about once every two weeks, and to get on board, you have to climb what looks pretty much like a stepladder from a DIY store. Inside, the plane looks like an old dollar van, only this one flies. The plane is pretty old, to say the least. So old, it's got these old-school no-smoking signs that go back to the times when smoking wasn't completely forbidden on flights yet. This red lever that looks like an emergency brake on a train is used to open the door in emergencies. The bathroom has a real towel instead of tissues. To wash your hands, you need to step on the pedal down there, which should start the water running. But something went wrong, no water. But they have a couple of tiny soap bars. Well, the loo is over here. You can just sit on it if you're tired sitting in your, let's say, honestly, pretty uncomfortable seat out there. Trust my word, even this loo is a bit comfier. But the view is absolutely breathtaking. The farther away we get from the mainland, the more it feels like we're traveling back in time, for thousands of years back. Like the Ice Age never ended and there's nothing here except these endless snow-capped volcano peaks. After an hour and a half flight, we're finally here. Wow. Look how beautiful it is. Look at these snow caps, they're stunning. It really is a breathtaking view because there's nothing man-made here for miles and miles around. Turn off the security camera. I am shooting myself. As of 2018, this place is no longer a restricted border security zone. And yet, upon arrival, you'll go through a border security check and they will enter your data into their database. They do it mostly to keep tabs on any foreign nationals visiting who need a special permit to come here, but also to keep an eye on all the other arrivals. Some crazy people try to come here and cross the Bering Strait skiing, believe it or not. And the officials can even arrange mobile border security checkpoints for them on request in order to make their cross-border endeavor legally possible. Our plane has landed in a place with a very beautiful name. Providence Bay. For hundreds of miles around, there's not a single human song. Very few people live here in a handful of villages, mostly whalers and local indigenous people. Check out the local police vehicles, such as this one. A UAZ off-roader on really big wheels to drive on frozen ice. This is the safest way to drive around here, on such big wheels, because they apply less pressure on ice and so there's less risk of falling through. And now you can see behind me some local public transport, two buses, one blue and another orange. They're heated and they usually take workers to their plants or factories. These are army-issue Ural trucks, fitted with cabins for people. The local road is a pathway made in the snow about 10 feet tall. On both sides of it, we start seeing abandoned houses and buildings. As we keep going, I realize that these aren't just some abandoned houses in the middle of a tundra. This rusty sign, Yureliki, marks a whole town. Presently, a ghost town. Yureliki was the place where all sorts of troops were stationed. Since the 1990s, it was home to a motor rifle regiment and part of Russia's Pacific Fleet. This is Vladimir Bichkov. Today, he is the director of the local national park, 
His father was serving in the military unit that was operating seaplanes, aeroplanes capable of taking off and landing on water. All the paperwork that has details about what kind of military served here right after World War II, what kind of machinery they had, and what was the mission of the force nicknamed the Invasion Army, is still classified. Originally, this was a settlement of the indigenous people, but later, between 1946 and 1948, they moved here a lot of troops. It was the so-called Rokossovsky's army. That's the name it was given back then. Over 30,000 troops were redeployed here between 1946 and 1948. Can you imagine it? This roughly equals half of the present-day Chukotka's entire population. September 1945 saw the end of World War II and Japan's capitulation. America's newly elected President Truman, who took over the government in April 1949, pursued a hardline anti-communist policy. He was also the one to OK the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. After that, the accounts differ on what happened. Soviet sources maintain that the US Navy became too active close to the Soviet border and were preparing for a landing. Western sources claim that Joseph Stalin was preparing to start a war on the United States by crossing the Bering Strait and advancing through Alaska and Canada. This way or another, the Cold War began and Stalin gave an order to build defense fortifications on the Chukotka Peninsula and to provide land-based anti-assault support to naval bases in Anadia Bay and Providence Bay. For example, right behind me was the local military command post. And here, behind this rusty fence and whatnot in all the snow, was the garrison guard room. And then, there were all the residential apartment blocks, lots of them. Behind them, there was a school, a big one, for 2,000 children who studied in two shifts. They invested into this place crazy loads of money and stuff and moved here lots of people. They built here all the infrastructure and moved here entire garrisons or rather entire military bases. Remember, they moved here a total of 30,000 people. You can't just check them all into a hotel or something. No, you need to build for them an entire town with hospitals, jobs, food courts and so on and so forth, with schools for their children and so on. This was in Ureliki, where I was born. What year was this? 1941. Right, so it... Before it broke out. I was born during the war there. I grew up in a felt boot, because back then there were no things for children. What do you mean, you grew up in a felt boot? My father would put me in a huge felt boot, and I stayed snug and warm there in any kind of weather. Dmitry Ladovsky was born a few decades before any concrete buildings were built in Ureliki. I remember when I was three, we were running along the coast in Providence Bay shouting, Liberty, Liberty, Liberty. Liberty was an American class of cargo ships that used to come to our shores, bypassing Japan every month. What did Liberty mean to us kids? Some chocolate, butter, and cookies. We always got something nice. Liberty ships brought food here under the Lend-Lease program that was agreed with Moscow and enacted by Washington in 1941. The United States provided the USSR with military vehicles, food, cotton, blankets, and so on. A total of $9.4 billion worth of aid. The program was wrapped up before World War II ended soon after Harry Truman assumed the presidency following President Roosevelt's death. When the Cold War started, they redeployed troops here, closer to the US. They built all these concrete buildings in tundra. There's a place called Sergeant's Crossing, it's, uh, it's a mountain crossing. They built lots of buildings there, uh, most probably for the officers. Further on, off the village Chiblino, there's a missile guard's volcano peak. That's where the missile silos used to be. They have been decommissioned and filled with earth. That's where the ballistic missiles were, close to America. Konstantin has lived all his life in Providence Village that's located across the bay from Ureliki. He has learned the story of the invasion army directly from the source, i.e. from the mouth of the older generations of the locals. There are no papers to support any of the details, but that's not because they aren't true. It's because everything has been classified for decades, and the truth stays hidden even today. 
The public official records only ever mention border patrols, and their presence was pretty much self-explanatory anyway. Motor ship Jan Joris arrived here from Vladivostok, transporting the 111th Red Banner Border Detachment. They made a stop in Emma Bay, which is not far from Providence Village, and had a seaport with some infrastructure since 1939. Village Yuriliki was right across the bay from Providence Village. Yuriliki didn't have many people living here. It had a very unfriendly rocky coastline and no vegetation, of course, since it's turned all around. Until then, only indigenous people lived in Yuriliki, formerly known as Eskimos. They inhabited the territory of Chukotka and Alaska long before the United States of America even existed. Oh, yes, it happened pretty often. When people would ask a hunter, where did you get this American Winchester rifle, it's really good, and the hunter would usually say something like, I had it, even if it was obviously brand new. There's no doubt that the indigenous people on both sides of the strait maintained a connection, both in the 1950s and in the 1960s. They visited each other on their whaleboats. They did? Of course they did. Just crossing the Bering Strait. Just crossing the Bering Strait. It's not that hard. The indigenous people on both sides are excellent seamen, you know. Soviet mass media reported that the Americans recruited indigenous people on their side to spy on the Soviet military. But Alexander Rekiel, son of probably the world's most famous Chukchi writer Yuri Rekiel, says it's just not true. He spent five years in Yureliki. All the people on the Chukotka Peninsula were properly vetted. Is it even possible to have an entire region full of vetted people? <laughs> it is, because there was no other way to get here except by undergoing a serious vetting process. When they, so to say, x-rayed you to your very core. I believe that border control also vetted all new arrivals for loyalty to the Soviet regime, ideals and lifestyle. Right, to weed out all the spies, so to say. Exactly that. The only thing I can say is, wow. It feels like I'm in a movie where time froze. Look at this entrance. It does feel like someone lived here not so long ago. There was life here. Almost all the windows have no glass. There are pieces of piping lying around. The way it all looks here really blows your mind. It's like some kind of Chernobyl in snow, you know? Wow. As I answered, just... Look at it. An abandoned entrance to the block of flats. Everything is covered in snow. Here, someone probably decided to leave the fridge behind, probably they couldn't arrange for transport, and it's been here ever since, all rusty now. This is a bathroom, and it looks so bizarre. Here is the hot water towel rail. Here are the thingies you hang a shower curtain with. And here are the laundry ropes for your socks and panties and whatnot. Still hanging in. 
Throughout the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, they kept building a full-scale town. It got to be big enough for thousands of people. They had three clubs here, and Providence only had one. Three clubs? Yeah. With a stage and seats. And a cinema with seats too. And we used to cross the bay to go to the dance nights there. Because we had one club and they had a choice of three. Thousands of people here served to guard, maintain, and operate military infrastructure. The reason was that Ureliki, Andir, and Uelin, all these locations on the eastern coast are part of the USSR that's closest to America. And reaching the United States with a medium range or even a short range missile fired from here was a slam dunk. It was easy. They could reach Alaska and even California. So basically, they could take out one third of the USA. Another top secret military facility that was an even bigger secret was a few hundred miles down the border. Here it is. Former restricted access town of Andir 1. Seeing its barbed wire fences and gun towers makes one think of Valim Shalomov's stories about miserable life in Soviet gulags in Kolyma. But this place had a different purpose. What looks like a regular mountain was, in fact, a top-secret underground nuclear facility where they stored nuclear warheads. A huge network of corridors built inside the mountain made it a multi-level facility, as big as a town. And the clearance level to get in here was high even for the military. Very few people got permits to enter, and most had permits only for certain designated areas. Walking down these corridors is a mind-blowing experience. I feel like I'm in some sort of Soviet-style version of Half-Life. Look, here is an overturned table that was probably used to plan strategies. They have cutouts for defense and offense lines here. There's also a control board that was used to alert the entire compound to possible threats of different levels, requiring high or full combat readiness, in case of real hostilities, I guess. All these military purpose tunnels were designed and built to dampen the shockwaves from any blasts. They are always built at an angle, about 30 or 35 degrees up or down, something like that. So if any explosion occurs inside or outside, the shockwave is sure to die out before it can affect the entire facility. You must remember writer Dmitry Ledovsky, who spent his early childhood in a felt boot in Ureliki. Well, he visited the place while it was active, when he worked for Soviet television. Yet he didn't even know that tens of thousands of troops were really stationed in Kuchotka back then. We were told three to five thousand. That's what they told you? Yes. Right. The truth was top secret. Uh, more than that, we weren't allowed to shoot much. Really? Well, of course. A barge would come and get us. We would drive on board in our gas truck. There would be a security check a couple of miles later. It was all close. There was a regular checkpoint. They asked for the purpose of the visit. We had to show a pass, which was pre-ordered. They would let us through, and we passed by rows of huge sealed containers with half a ton bombs in them. Then we arrived to the garrison and showed our shooting plan, which was already pre-agreed with Gyurim's top officers. In general, getting to shoot Gyurim was a coveted job. One got to shoot some interesting footage. Also, the military were always very hospitable, and the food was very good. Also, you got a chance to walk around a bit and even shop in their stores. Also, it was a chance to experience all this military power. You saw rows of soldiers, rows of APCs, all that. But they never let us inside the silos, of course. We were allowed to shoot APCs and soldiers on drills, eating and so on, but we were never allowed anywhere near the silos. So you've never been inside the mountain? No. At the entrance, they have this behemoth of a door. That's, in fact, a huge thick door mounted on a frame on wheels. It weighs over 100 tons. The door's purpose is to secure the entrance from any shockwave if the enemy were ever to really drop a bomb somewhere close and the shockwave would affect this area. The incoming threat would be detected early enough on its way here and this huge monstrosity would be placed into position in time to seal the entrance off. I've seen a twin of this monster door in Zahelinogorsk, where it's still operational. It was probably a standard solution for Soviet facilities of this kind back then. Local activist and author of a popular YouTube channel about life in Chukotka, Yevgeny Bazov, is giving me a tour of the facility. 
They have narrow gorge railway tracks here to deliver stuff all around. Here is the engine car which would pull a chain of trolleys along the tracks. And they had tracks in every corridor, so they had track switches like this one. And it still works, I'll be damned. So here we go, the next metro station is... <laughs> I always have my doubts about this idea of an invasion, you see, because the Bering Strait is never calm. It's always rough water here, and I can't really imagine getting tanks to cross it and land for invasion. Although Soviet tank troops in Gidam told us they were ready for any combat threat here. For real? They did. Dmitry Ladovsky wrote a book of fiction about that top secret military base. It's called Gidam. You can Google it. The place's real name is Gidam. They say it was the second name of the base's first commander. According to a local legend, once the secret facility was completed, Gidam received congratulations from the USA, which made him shoot himself. All the paperwork about this facility is still top secret, and most likely it's just a legend because Soviet intelligence was certainly expecting the USA to keep watching all military deployments close to their border from space. Was an invasion ever a real possibility? Of Alaska? Yeah, from Chukotka. Well, I think launching an invasion from Chukotka was a utopian idea. Try to imagine how many military transport ships are necessary to invade Alaska. Or how many transport airplanes that not only need to fly there, that's okay, that's not far, about 100 miles, but they also need to land somewhere. Where would they get so many paratroopers to send 30,000 men to land in Alaska? I don't think that the Soviet military were seriously considering a plan to invade Alaska. Right, I actually think the same. It seems more like it was some sort of a psychological warfare move. That's right, deterrent strategy, yes, yes. Because in the 1970s and 80s, both sides already had satellites. And my understanding is that satellite surveillance was everyone's go-to source of information, and they were bound to see whatever Soviet troops were deployed there, as if on purpose to get on the American radar. That's right, there's no doubt about that. And first of all, you've seen it for yourself. The terrain in Chukotka is mostly bare. There's very little vegetation. There are no tall trees, only volcanoes in the sea. Volcanoes in the tundra. It's a huge open space and concealing large numbers of troops here from the American satellites or even from the American planes flying in their own airspace would be really, really hard. All in all, it's a good thing that all this infrastructure with the rail tracks, planning table and so on was never put to use, just like the military base in Ureliki. Look, this place even has a buzzer. Or rather, it's where the buzzer used to be. And look what they've got here on the floor. A loo. It's broken. Check out the wallpaper, so bright and pretty, nice, I'd say. I bet someone took care to pick the color and design. The ceiling storage, that I hate so much. Every Soviet apartment had those, and they just made the small space with low ceilings even smaller. Wow, look at this. A frozen kitchen filled with snow. It feels like this town not just stayed in the past with the Soviet Union, but froze into that past. In the 1990s, the troops and their families were relocated from here to the mainland, leaving this ghost town behind. So how did it all end? What was the outcome of all this huge effort, this crazy standoff? Here, you can see it pretty well. That's how it ended. One, two, three. All these rows of abandoned buildings stretching to the horizon, this ghost town. It feels like, you know, someone played a bit with some playthings and then just abandoned them, lying around. And they're lying here, scattered, unclaimed, and unwanted. Like, well, this experiment's over, let's move on.
So, if you want to choose your own strategy and gain in epic battles and take over the world, Conflict of Nations is the best game for you. It's a free online PvP strategy game happening in a modern global warfare. And I'd like to remind you that today you get an exclusive gift, so click the link in the description, download this game, and you will get 15,000 of gold for free, and you also get a one month of premium subscription also for free. This offer is available only for 30 days, so don't lose time. Click the link in the description, choose your country, and find the way you want to victory. My dear friends, it's my personal opinion, and I'm not saying that anyone should agree with me. Of course, there will be people who say that if we didn't build nuclear facilities here, the USA would certainly cross the strait on ships, kayaks, or walruses to take over the endless snow-covered shores of Chukotka, where minus 40 degrees is considered normal temperature, and during snowstorms, people use ropes hanging between the houses to be able to make their way home. Another possible viewpoint is that, well, all these billions could have been well spent developing this territory, building roads, extending a gas pipeline here, which is something that hasn't been done till today. Instead of digging silos, building military bases, guard rooms, and iron fences. And it's possible that in this case, at the very least, the entire Chukotka GDP wouldn't be four times smaller than Alaska's.